uh, for me, it wasn't something that happened by the de by design or by um, by calling you know early in life or anything like this. I never set out um, to work in disaster risk management or in post disaster reconstruction uh, consciously. Um, I am an, ar an architectural historian by training. So uh, this actually came about as a result of a series of small seminars that I was offering and developing that address the role of architects in creating and advancing social justice. And I just so happened to be at a dinner. <laughs> and it was quite a quite happy accident to be seated next to a young Chinese publisher. It was just after the Sichuan earthquake. Um, and we were talking about these issues. And he said, wow, you know, somebody should write um, a book on this. And I simply heard myself say, uh, well, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> and, so, and so that's how it started. And it became, yeah, it became, the book became Beyond Shelter, actually. Well, I mean, my, my challenges are, when, and just coming into the field, you have to keep in mind that I came in as kind of an academic and a journalist and a writer um, and presenting other people's work um, and trying to get their work out there, get the best practices and the best questions and some of the best, uh, at least uh, temporary solutions uh, known. So that role, however, has its limits because I didn't know enough. Uh, I couldn't go far, far enough. In, in, in terms of my own interest, to be able to, to consider myself credible. So I needed to be in the field. Um, and so I went into the field right after the Haiti earthquake in 2010 um, and uh, with a project that was funded by the uh, French-American um, uh, Cultural Exchange. And we were there for three years um, under, that, under that project cover. And so that was my initiation to to field work, so that was an enormous challenge um, in itself. But I think the more recent challenges are shifting away from thinking that the the challenge is the earthquake or the challenge is the as the event. Um, in fact, my, recently in Nepal, it seems to me that um, the real challenge in working with many of these places and the statistics are really troubling. You know, sixty percent of these countries with aid, they don't have the capacity to absorb the funding. And 77% of those are in terms of water and sanitation. And then, you know, 20 to 44%, some absurd figure, all of it's lost. And where is it going? You know, it's going to corruption. But we want to think that, you know, hey, we're here, we can do it. It's okay, let's come with it. It's, you know, people are just lazy or they don't work hard enough or they don't have a shared vision. But it's not that. It's that people are... Corruption is largely hidden from us. And, um, you know, after working for two weeks in Nepal, what I learned from corruption is that... Um, it creates a way of life, a life of passivity. Uh, it's passive, but it's just sheer exhaustion, inspiration, and not laziness. Um, you know, the root cause of the problems in, the, you know, sending your workforce to the Qatari desert. You know, it's very hard to think construction, you know, in the long term, um, and what, uh, what the economy of economics of reconstruction can offer a country. The country is sending its, you know, it's for essentially sending it out of the country. So you have to questions are, um, what's getting in your way rather than uh, we tend to operate in silos and that won't do anymore. So I think the greatest challenge is really uh, trying to effectively dismantle those silos. Um, no, we're largely, I mean, I've been in Haiti for the last five years. Uh, that's doing a little bit right now. But I have to say kind of a personal choice because um, people seem to be either in lots of places or to focus on specific context um, or to kind of stay put somewhere and establish really long-term relationships. I like the, the latter example personally because I think establishing long-term relationships is really, really key uh, to seeing that things might be able to work. Um, uh, but at the Water Atlas Consortium, which is where uh, I'm doing most of my work now, we're debating this, you know, how does this choice get made? And, you know, is it working with a principal partner? And maybe that partner helps to establish those priorities of, for example, we're talking with the Center for Disease Control. And they're helping, you know, their partners will help set priorities for us. 
um, with certain institutional thematics like hotspots, like risk hotspots, um, where we find the same problems coming up over and over again, but they're it's always as if we didn't realize or didn't expect it to happen somehow. Um, and the third way is to think about um, an approach that's singular, right? We have we're, we're articulating an approach that's rather singular. We have several themes that we work with, but our specific singularity is really thinking about complex coordination. And this has to do, again, with my really deep belief that we can't work in silos anymore. But it's not so simple, you know, it's, um, it's, it's not an easy thing to collaborate. Uh, and um, I think that the the, na the nature of complex collaboration has to be able to demonstrate win-win situations and they have to because you know often people just have misaligned priorities you know it's not that they don't necessarily want to work together or it's not necessarily true that they're hiding their information or they're you know it's um, it's contentious but they just have there's everything is misaligned so they can't find ways in and so the kind of what we do working on water and choosing to work kind of above the noise and on a subject that federates people um, it's, it's specifically there you know we specifically chose that way of working so that we could work um, in this in this manner that it would help federate stakeholders across the board from whether they're community members and community water boards or or you know the Ministry of Water It's not, it's, it's not easy and I, I think you just have to hold it as the vision and then know that it's going to take a long time. <laughs> know that there are a lot of steps and I can give you an example right now. You asked me what we're working on. Um, six months ago we tried to help uh, the water ministry in Haiti um, reposition and kind of restart its water observatory. And that money kind of walked out the door. A lot of money was dedicated after the... Um, after the earthquake, it uh, went away uh, somehow, and and uh, the people who invested in in that um, in that project just threw up their hands in frustration, and rightfully so. You know, it's International Development Bank and UNICEF, and a lot of people who really they actually tried to put a business in place, um, and you know, the directors like <laughs> quit, and and it was just stagnating. And we wanted to try, and we offered our services to try to get it back online and everybody said no 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 and you'll never get to do it and nobody wants you to do it and it's highly political and this that and the other and and just two days ago you know they called and said well maybe you should be doing it um, because they don't know how to do it <laughs> and they need you know they need a team that's there in place that can make this an efficient project and can succeed and and can insist I mean we know when we know enough we're on the ground there to be able to insist through the relationships that we have built there for years and through the trust that we have with our partners. Well, I think I would define it right now as there's, um, there's something called the dis disaster recovery framework that's coming through with the World Bank and others. Um, which I participated in at the very beginning of the reflection, and I would like—I think I would position myself there. And essentially, it's as the bridge from the emergency stage to development. You know, and really, we're we're looking to build tools for that bridge, that bridge those two very separate and diverse entities and practices. And so, it's really, I, I guess, in recovery. You know, it's not in the emergency phase that we work. Um, it, it enables long-term development, but we work more um, specifically in this, uh, on this idea that we can figure out how to build tools that are not only institutional or financial tools, but like real tools that people can use, such as online platforms or um, you know, really bringing technology to people, uh, which is part of what we do through uh, one of our entities, which is called Potential 3.0, is bringing tools and lightweight, easy to use technology to people to have so that they end up at the end of the day with greater autonomy and greater um, self um, independence and self sufficiency around resource management. So I would position us there.
One of the things that I would say about that, and this is immensely important to me, um, is try to know what's going on. <laughs> try to, there's a tendency to think that there's nothing going on, there's nothing happening, or whatever's happening is at little value, or it's, it'll only slow you down, or it'll get in the way of your contract or your mandate. But um, there are people working already, and they know what they're doing in large part. They may not always have the means or the capacity to do things, um, but we tend not to to give them the, the value that they deserve. Um, and I really think that it's absolutely critical to know what's going on, who's doing what, and how, how well is that going? You know, where can you add value? You know, the principle should be to add value. You know, it shouldn't be that you come and you check the box because, you know, your donor gave you money, you know, to put in a well or to build a school or, um, you know, to finish a street or something like this, and then you check the box and leave. It really should be that you're there knowing what is needed um, and where the value that you bring can be most um, uh, beneficial and exploited to its, you know, to the greatest impact, you know, sort of for the greatest good, um, and that it's not our little, <laughs> that it's not our little project. Yeah, I would say one thing about this really important communication strategy, and that is, um, I brought up this idea of diverse teams, and you know, it's, and it's so great to have all these wonderful different kinds of people, but we shouldn't buy, be naive about what that means. It's hard it is. Um, you know, partnerships and interdisciplinary work is really, really hard, and it's not, it's not because you have five people in the same room who do five different things, and they're all on the same team, that it's interdisciplinary, right? It doesn't make us work well on the same project. So you have to, we speak different languages, we speak different professional languages, we have different objectives, our methods, you know, for realizing them are not, not the same necessarily. And so effective collaboration um, and a kind of like working toward like a coherence, you know, really to be coherent at the end of the day, no matter what, how hard it's, to, you know, however hard it is and how difficult it is to understand the other person's point of view. Um, it's not something that happens by default. It's something that, that happens by design, you know, just like every other part of the project. 